Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our outdoor learning webinar. Welcome to any new faces and also those returning again. It's great to have you all here. I'm Charlene McKeown from Keat Northern Ireland Beautiful, and I'm the Environmental Education Manager, managing projects such as Eco Schools and Young Reporters for the Environment. And my role is funded by the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. Eco Schools are absolutely over the moon to have our new outdoor learning topic partner, Danske Bank, come on board with us and they're sponsoring today's event. So this is our fifth EcoSchools webinar since the beginning of the new year. So however, for many of you, this is your first webinar of many on your journey and taking part in Danske Bank's Outdoor Learning Garden Project. So today we have the fabulous Jilly Dugan along with us. Jilly is the Biodiversity Recovery Coordinator at Keat Northern Ireland Beautiful and is collaborating with myself at EcoSchools on this fantastic project. So she has installed edible gardens, uh, spaces for both uh, the private and the public sector and has written a book for schools entitled So Grow Munch, which was adopted by SIA in collaboration with Tourism NI. So today, Jilly will tell you all about the importance of outdoor learning and reconnecting with nature. She'll be highlighting some local biodiversity for you to look out for and ways in which you can all play your part um, both at home and in school in battling the biodiversity crisis. So before I hand over to Jilly, I want to tell you a little bit about the project and uh, welcome along the schools today he'll be taking part. So our partner Danske Bank have kindly funded EcoSchools to install 11 outdoor learning garden spaces with log seating and fruit trees and bushes for everybody to get involved in. So the 11 schools have been picked from all over the country uh, with one from each council area. I'd like to welcome the 11 schools along today to our webinar. So they are Our Lady of Lourdes Primary School, Belfast, Ali Sally Primary School, Korean. Drummer Hall Primary School, Lisburn Central Primary School, Harryville Primary School, Ballymena, Gail Scully Rua, Dungannon, Christian Brothers Primary School, Armagh, Academy Primary School, Saintfield, Rathcool Primary School and Nursery, St Patrick's Primary School, Hollywood, and last but not least, Oma Integrated Primary School. So not only are the gardens going to be installed with the help of our young people, they are also going to receive an education package supporting this learning on this journey with workshops, including things like planting, maintaining, picking, preserving, pruning, cutting, propagating, you name it. Jilly and myself will be getting stuff in and teaching everybody all they need to know. So this is our first sort of start on this journey. So we're really excited to launch this project today and hopefully all together tackle this biodiversity crisis that we're facing. And while we're doing that, reconnect with nature and really begin to love it again. So if you have any questions or comments uh, you'd like to ask Jilly or myself throughout the webinar, I'll be monitoring the chat, so please just pop it in there and hopefully we'll get through them all at the end. So um, I think I've spoke for enough, uh, long enough, Jilly. So without further ado, I'll pass you over to uh, Jilly Dugan, our guest speaker. Thank you. Thanks very much, Charlene. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to be working on, on this project as well and with Charlene on, on the Greater Eco Schools um, Project. So what, what is the importance of outdoor learning? Um, there's been lots of research done that suggests that the way school grounds are developed, used and managed can have a significant positive impact on people's attitude and behaviours towards school, towards each other and to the wider environment and society. And being outdoors means that you notice more things in your environment. So you might notice the trees, the grass, the flowers, the bees and insects. But because when you're outside, you can hear them, you can see them, you might be able to touch them or smell them or indeed all of those things. And perhaps if you were in an orchard with ripe fruit or in a herb garden or a vegetable garden, you'd be able to taste them too. So being outdoors makes you aware of all of your senses and of the things that are really important in our environment. Um, and we're all well aware of the devastating impact that COVID-19 has had on the world. Um, but there, if there are some positives, I think one of those has to be that everybody has begun to reconnect much more with nature and the value of nature that we have in our doorsteps. So our local parks and green areas have helped all of us through these very difficult and tough times. And it's really important that we help to look after them. And many of you taking part in this project are the children of key workers. And this project will give you an opportunity to get outdoors and make a difference as well. So let's return the favour to our environment. Um, and through this project, and actually a lot of the stuff that Eco Schools does in general, we hope to be able to show you how to do this. 
So there are lots of big words bandied about, like um, biodiversity and ecology and environment and conservation and um, and lots of those and there are lots of lots of programs on the TV. Um, but really, what does biodiversity mean? And in the very simplest form, it just means nature. It means um, everything around us, which includes all the living creatures that live in the earth and in the seas and in the lakes as well. So that means everything from the tiniest plankton, which you can see on this my top left hand corner there. Um, it means all the microorganisms in the soil. It means the, the flowers and the grasses, the birds, the mammals, the cuddly furry ones, um, the slightly more scary ones maybe, like the snakes. Um, and all and everything in the ocean, and that includes um, the corals and the plants in the ocean, um, the tiny plankton to the biggest fish and, and the huge whales. Um, and obviously insects are really important. Um, they're so, they're, the whole of the natural world um, is made up of, it's like a jigsaw of lots of different living things, be that animal and plant. And all of them are absolutely important um, for biodiversity in terms of what we need as people. So, as I said, each of the species on Earth work together in ecosystems. And ecosystem is just, it's, it's like a network. It, it's like a club where they're all working together so that um, they can provide everything we need to live a health, healthy life. And that means, what do we need as humans? So we need... Uh, clean air and clean water and um, we need food to eat to survive um, we need shelter and we also need um, medicine so um, I'm sure everybody is is aware of the bees butterflies hoverflies um, all of those are pollinators that will visit the flowers on fruit trees and bushes and and nut trees um, and tomato plants, peppers, an awful lot of the things that we eat need to be pollinated by some kind of pollinator. Um, and so the bees, hover, hoverflies and butterflies help us to do that um, and, are, and really are hugely important. Um, trees, and not just trees, but wetlands and soils and different kinds of habitats will absorb carbon from the atmosphere. Again, we hear a lot about carbon and climate change. Um, so basically trees and plants will um, absorb carbon, help to purify the air and release oxygen, which is the thing that we, we breathe. And then there are things that um, maybe some of us aren't so aware of that you know, most medicines nowadays have come from nature. So, um, so the poppy, um, poppy plant produces poppy seeds, which would give us morphine and coding. And these, these drugs um, are used to treat patients in severe pain. So maybe after they've had a wee operation or something. Um, so there we go. Um, and so what can you find at your school and where you live? You know, sometimes we watch the TV and it, it, it's, it's kind of all about monkeys and lions and, and bison. And, um, but... Do you know what? Biodiversity is right outside your front door. It's right outside your school. And there's so many things that when you start looking around that you can discover. And so in terms of plants, we've got um, short grass, long grassy areas, which are, are brilliant places to hide and breed and feed for plants. Um, Obviously, we've got trees, um, trees that, that look beautiful, provide habitat for insects and birds and things for them to eat. We have fruit bushes and fruit trees, which provide um, beautiful things for us to eat, but also the wider biodiverse community. So, you know, it's if sometimes the wasps get to one of the apples before you do, well, you know, they need to eat as well. And um, flowers, obviously, um, provide pleasure for us, excuse me, oh. um, in that they smell wonderful, they look wonderful, but also they provide pollen and nectar for pollinators. And um, hedges, hedges, 
especially fruit and flowering hedges or ones with a variety of plants are brilliant habitat for, for birds, for all types of insects and um, even small mammals and of course vegetables as well. So if you're lucky enough in your school garden to have um, a vegetable garden and you work outside in that, you'll be able to see the variety of, of worms and millipedes and centipedes in there as well. Birds. So in I mean, Northern Ireland, there are lots of common ones now up on the screen. Um, the wee robin. I'm sure if you've been feeding the birds, we've all been seeing these guys about lately. Um, we've got we've got blue tits, um, chaffinches, um, pigeon, common wood pigeon. We've also got starlings, sparrows. Um, and the swallows, which this month will be starting to come back from, from where they've been in warmer climates and coming back to Northern Ireland to spend the summertime there. Um, if you're really lucky, you might spot something more rare, like, like a woodpecker or a buzzard. Um, and again, in Eco Schools, we love to hear about any unusual visitors that you have visiting your school. And then to the animals. Um, and some of these animals are, you know, they're quite shy, they're nocturnal. I'm thinking about badgers and hedgehogs. So they would rather come out at night, I suppose, as, as does the fox. Um, squirrels, we have, um, even where I live here, we have quite a lot of, with about four or five cheeky wee grey squirrels. Um, and obviously there are mice. Uh, rats, nobody wants to think about those <laughs> so much or want them near your house, but again, they are an important part of the environment. Um, and then we also have the soil dwellers, which are really, really important. So we've got um, worms and worms are important because, you know, you've got um, dead leaves and dead vegetation and worms will take that down into the soil to feed and enrich your soil. Um, and make a really healthy environment to grow plants, particularly vegetables and stuff, um, millipedes, centipedes, and your soil is 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 kind of a microcosm of of it's like a whole planet in itself because there are lots of different um, bacteria and microscopic beings that live in the soil that are really important for the health of our soil and healthy soil means healthy food and insects then um, insects are kind of I suppose above the soil dwellers then we have our insects which are in a really really important layer because insects provide food for um, for birds and other predators so you've got um, bumblebees those lovely fuzzy black and yellow and maybe they're a wee bit of white and maybe there's a wee bit of of red bums on the bumblebees. Um, there are also honeybees. We don't have a picture up here, but you might see small, we sort of brownie blacky honeybees that kind of look a bit like a wasp, but um, have no yellow on them. We've got butterflies. We've got moths, which may not on the outside look just as colorful or beautiful as butterflies, but again, really important for pollination. Um, we've got common flies. Eerie wigs, oh, excuse me, sorry. Um, spiders, not everybody's favorite, but again, really, really important part of, of nature and the world we live in. Ladybirds, um, ladybirds are, are beautiful wee insects and they eat the aphids that would eat our plants like salad leaves and spinach and stuff like that. Um, dragonflies, dragonflies, if you've got a pond or um, you're beside a river or a boggy patch, you might be lucky enough to see some dragonflies um, and also the daddy, daddy long legs, um, which are quite common, um, and beetles. So some of those are, some of those are more beautiful than others, but they're all really necessary for um, for the world we live in. So I'm going to show you uh, I'm going to show you a quick video which we think is kind of really important. Uh, I'm hoping this is going to work.
biodiversity is a term that represents the total variety of all life on Earth. That's a big thing to sum up. Thousands of different world habitats, millions of different species, billions of different individuals, and the trillions of different characteristics they all have. The total biodiversity of our planet is immense, which is a good thing, because the more biodiversity, the more secure all life on Earth is, including ourselves. Only when life is at its most varied, vigorous, biodiverse, can we hope to thrive. We may not know it, but we need towering forests across one third of the land surface to lock away carbon and keep the climate stable. We need millions of pollinators and billions of soil organisms and megatons of plankton to keep the food we eat in supply. We need strange plants deep in jungles to create our medicines and coral reefs and mangrove swamps to protect the coasts we depend upon. Our planet's biodiversity provides all the things we need for free, but it will only do so if there's lots of it, and at the moment it's under attack. In the last 50 years, our activities have dramatically reduced biodiversity across the globe. We've snuffed out habitats, reduced populations of wild animals by 60%, and even driven whole species extinct. The number of lions in Africa has dropped by 65%. The number of individual flying insects in Europe has dropped by 75%. The number of bluefin tuna in the Pacific has dropped by 95%. Biodiversity is dropping everywhere and fast. This is catastrophic for nature and therefore ourselves. We talk about climate change a lot, but biodiversity loss is as important an issue. How do we stop this loss of life? How do we ensure that biodiversity, our planet's vital statistic, begins to increase again? In fact, we already know exactly what to do. Follow Our Planet, visit ourplanet.com and watch the series on Netflix. Okay, so that was the fantastic Sir David Attenborough. Um, yeah, after, so yes, after watching that um, video, I suppose it's really important to say, don't worry, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, the biodiversity crisis is real and I suppose none of us can um, not notice that if you know we're watching the TV and there's so many brilliant programs and stuff about but there are so many things that you can do um, either in, in your own environment, in your own home, at your own school and um, so it, it's something that collectively as a society you know children and adults together can all fix um, and doing your wee bit in your school or around your home is really going to help with that. Um, next slide, please. Yes, so you can play your part to help and at the same time have lots of fun. So, you know, the first step is getting outside, um, noticing things in your environment, um, enjoying them and putting in place small improvements that is going to help um, the habitats around your school in particular and um, I'm going to help with all of those wee creatures like giving them a home, giving them shelter and keeping them safe. So next slide please. And so simple things that you can do to help um, provide habitat is um, so leave a corner of your garden to grow wild, to provide a place for local wildlife to live and feed. So that's, I know everybody wants a really neat, um, neat and tidy garden and that's fine. But you know what, around the hedges or in one corner or that bit at the bottom of the garden, um, 
it's really good to let that grow. And when you let it grow, there, you know, wild plants um, will just appear as if by magic. So in the grass, you'll get things like clover, um, which are really good for pollinators. Um, and you're creating a little habitat for all sorts of insects to live in over the winter time. Um, if you've ruined your garden, plant flowering hedges, shrubs or trees. Um, as I said before, a variety of species like um, hawthorn, blackthorn, um, dog roses, gelder rose, hazel, um, willow are all really, really good for all sorts of wildlife. Um, do not spray pesticides or herbicides, which is a really great killer around your property. Um, if that must be done, if if it must be done, if you could do it at, especially with like a, a pesticide, you know, at, if you could do it at night time when the insects are um, inside and out of harm's way, that would really help. But actually in an ideal world, you don't need to use them and, and please try not to. Um, you can create nesting habitats or bug hotels for solitary bees. Um, and if you wanted to take that a little bit further, you could um, also put up nesting boxes for birds. You can plant pollinator friendly bulbs to flower next spring. So I know that everybody loves um, daffodils, but actually in terms of nectar and pollen, daffodils look gorgeous, but they're not that brilliant for, um, for our insects. So things like snowdrops and crocuses and um, the wee grape hyacinth and alliums, Anything single flowered is really good for pollinators. Um, obviously it goes without saying, be sure to keep your spaces neat and tidy and don't drop litter. Um, don't be afraid to pick up other people's litter as long as you've got you know, gloves or a litter picker. Um, because not everybody has a good conscience about the environment. And unfortunately, sometimes they do have to pick up other people's litter. Um, and coming back to leaving um, a small space in your garden to grow wild, if you leave a strip of grass unmown, so that could even be half a metre or a metre, so that um, native flowers like the clover and the buttercup um, can come up and provide habitat and food. And if you've got pots, window ba boxes or hanging baskets, choose plants which are good for pollinators again, such as um, Flowering herbs, wallflowers, lavender, cosmos, poached egg plant, um, chives. So the advantage of some of those, um, obviously with the herbs, is that you get to eat them as well. And so next slide, or I think that might be might be the end. Um, yes, what I'd like you to do is hopefully follow the 11 schools that are taking part. Um, in this program on our social media so they'll be sharing with us the different things that are happening the planting days um, and it'll be at eco schools ni so we have our facebook or twitter and our instagram we also have a youtube channel where this video will go up and um, yeah i think it's really important what jilly raised as well like we are in a biodiversity crisis but don't worry about it we don't want people going away from here in a panic there are things we can do and this project's a great step forward for that but whether your school's involved in the project or not um it's not a major concern because we will, all our lessons we get up online, you can all participate in them. Um, Jilly, we did have, we actually um, had one question specifically and I actually Googled the answer. <laughs> um, we found it difficult to find, but I'm, I'm wondering if you could help me any on it. Why do bees sting? This is what we were asked. Is it because they're angry? What, it, what Do we know why they sting? No, bee, um, bees don't sting. Bees sting because they're angry, but they're only angry when they feel threatened. So if I'm a beekeeper as well, so I have, I keep colonies of honeybees um, and I have three colonies and each of them have about 50,000 bees in them. So, and on these nice days and during the summer, they're all out and about flying all over the place. And just walking about the garden, there are loads and loads of honeybees and I would never get stung in, in, in that way. It's only whenever I start taking the roof off them and, and poking and poking through them and having a look and seeing whether there's any of their honey that we could steal a little bit of that they start to get really annoyed and would sting. So bees will um, only sting if they feel really, really threatened. The thing about bees is that if they do sting, um, they die. So they need to be really, really committed. Um, wasps, are slightly different. Wasps are really important as well, but wasps can sting you multiple times and 
and, and they don't die. So so a bee, it's the last resort for a bee. So it's if you squish one or you stand on it or you know, you put your hand on it by mistake, then they might sting. But when they're just flying about minding their own business and you're minding your own business, they'll not sting. Okay. And um, we have another one here. So one school have mentioned that they have um their entire school playground is tarmac. So we've seen that in quite a few schools, even some we've been out to visit. Um, but they're going to get some really large planters. So um, they were thinking about, it says, where can we get willow to begin to create a willow tunnel? And could we grow it out of planters or tires? Oh, well, well willow is, is pretty resilient. Um, you, to grow a willow tunnel, you'd need a, you'd need a huge, big planter. But, I, you know, I can... I can imagine if you had two or three tires stacked on top of each other and filled with soil that willow grows mostly anywhere, you know, and it grows really quickly. So it, it doesn't need it doesn't need any special conditions. Um, I'm going to ask my friends and the cons conservation volunteers um, if, if they have any examples of that. Um, and maybe Charlene, can, we can pass that on to her yeah. last question. But yeah. Um, yeah, I think, or the other thing is you could make two, you could take, make two rows of quite narrow raised beds um, instead of tires, fill those with soil and then the middle bit could be your tunnel. So I'm sure there is a way to do that. But you know, even if you only have tarmac there, you know, you can grow, you can grow things like potatoes and big bags, old compost bags. Um, you can use all sorts of, um, containers to grow flowers and vegetables and you know not not having a grassy space shouldn't shouldn't well. anybody off. I've actually just popped my email in there Eileen if you want to um, ping me through a little email and we'll follow up with you on that. Um, we have Jacqueline I think it's McCallion has mentioned that they have found what they think are rabbit holes or burrows in our school grounds. Should they do anything or should they just leave them be or what what's the best thing to do? Should they look into protecting them or putting signage up? What do we think? Well, I, I would just leave them be. I mean, the, the, you know, animals kind of choose their, their own place to live and, and they're obviously quite happy in your school grounds. So, um, I will, I, you know, I just leave them be. Again, they're probably not going to come out during the daytime when there's lots of children and lots of noise around. And they'll probably come out at night time to feed and trim the grass for you. Um, so, yeah, just, just leave them be and, and, and they'll find their own food and, you know, um, should they look into feeding them or just no I no. wouldn't no absolutely so just not. the children to do that because children are going to see bunny rabbits they're going to think oh yes let's all give them our lunch but that's probably not a good idea so maybe educate yeah. children around that not to feed them absolutely because I mean it, yeah because rabbits were you know they like grass and they like greenery and um, it's they, and actually unless you have vegetable beds or or, or something that's when they can become a problem and maybe have to put up a wee fence or something. But uh, but actually we have, lot, again, as Charlene said, I live in the sticks, I live in the country and um, we have lots of rabbits around here and generally they don't bother with the herbs and vegetables. Okay. And we had another one. So what's the best growing calendar to give pupils and families for home learning? So I know Jilly and I have actually, um, we're working on a, a separate thing around, um, I suppose, windowsill growing. Um, so it might be probably the best place for most people to start. So I'm hoping to put that really, out, I think, in the end of March. But is there anything in particular, Jilly, that you think a best growing calendar? Maybe we should share that with some, even the one that we're using for the gardens. It's possible we, to share that. Um, we, could, we could, absolutely. Again, the um, SEA have um, the Growing for the Future website, um, which is designed specifically for schools. But... Um, and there are lots of really, lots of really nice ideas there for, you know, around that school calendar. But it will also say, you know, if if you're growing strawberries in school, it's better to use these varieties because at least you get to eat them, you know, if they, they ripen early or late. But if you're doing something at home, it doesn't really matter because you're going to be at home. So, you, you know, you'll, they're ready when they're ready and you're going to get them, which is great. Um, can you repeat, what was the website, Jilly? Was it SIA? Somebody's just asked there. SIA, SIA and I, um, Growing for the Future. Growing for the Future. I'll just put that in the chat so people can go on and have a wee look at it. 
it's also got lesson plans for um all the key stages as well based yeah. on you know what you could be growing so I, it's great and it's got lots of wee videos with me in it oh lovely well i think um the good thing about what uh, jelly and i've been working on about the windowsill stuff i find that um i'm not the most handy in the garden but i, I personally would like to be much better and I had asked Jilly when we, she first came on board, can we write like an idiot's guide? Um, because that's how I felt when it came to planting. Um, so we're hoping that we've devised something really simplistic for families and for people just to be able to do from home. And as I said, that will be launched at the end of the month. Um, and it'll be up on the Eco Schools website for you to be able to download. Um, I can't see any um, further questions now. So I suppose um, what I should do is I should thank everybody. Um, so Jelly, first of all, I can't thank you enough for coming on and doing this today for us. You are an in-house expert and I know we're very lucky to have you on board. Um, the 11 schools that are on board, you'll all get to see Jelly and I out. Um, I know you have another two workshops coming up um, in the next few weeks and then hopefully our planting will begin. Um, I want to thank our Outdoor Learning Topic Partner, Danske Bank, for making today possible and this entire project possible. And um, I can see by the amount of attendees that everybody's really excited about it. Um, don't panic if any of your friends or colleagues have missed the webinar today. As I said, it will be it has been recorded and you'll get a lovely version of it on our YouTube channel and on the school's website. Um, all the children attending today or any of the adults attending today, you'll all receive your international um, certificate of attendance from the Federation of Environmental Education. And um, please check out our website and social media for future webinars. I know tomorrow we have Sarah Roberts um, as our guest speaker and she's the author of Somebody Swallowed Stanley. Um, so she's going to be on talking about turtles and sharks and lots of the problems plastics are causing them. And I know she was actually bitten by a shark. So um, her stories are pretty interesting. So I uh, hope to see you along tomorrow for it. So for now, it is goodbye from the Eagle Schools team and Jilly. And thank you very much. Take care, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.